I'm Janet Forrest, and this is Behind the Shelves. I grew up in a military family. There were five siblings and the library was such a great place to go because, you know, mom would say, yes, get as many books as you can hold. You know, it didn't cost you anything. And she would run upstairs to fiction and just leave us to pick out our own books. So she definitely started my love of libraries. It seems like some kids are just born readers and destined to have a close relationship with libraries. Some children walk into a library and see a new world open up to them. They see possibility. I was a library kid. You know, I really was. You know, I grew up with a lot of books in the house. You know, they were just books were just part of my life. I I don't know if there's such a thing as a book kid or a library kid, but that that definitely ran through, you know, the way I was raised. Books were always around. I was such a book kid. I think that's really what made it important to me because I just love checking out books. And the first time I could read a chapter book, I was so excited about it. And it came from the library. Leslie Malcolm, head of the Athenaeum's Wheezy Library for Children, remembers being inspired by libraries when she was little. I do remember cruising the bookshelves, looking at all the books and seeing a copy of The Secret Garden and thinking, oh, wow, you know, if I could ever read a book that thick, uh, that would just be amazing. She also remembers that it can be a little scary, too. And she keeps that in mind as she introduces young patrons to their public library. And, you know, years later, when I finally did read A Secret Guard, it just always makes me chuckle about how intimidating a library can be for a small child and how intimidating just the thickness of a book can be for them, just the physical appearance of it can intimidate them. Those are things I think about all the time. I've just recently read an article in one of my journals about a lot of libraries across the country now are They're into buying large print format books for kids. It's not as intimidating. They open up the book and they go, oh, the print isn't too small. This is a good one. And it's easier on the eye to read. It's a, a lot of libraries are starting large print collections for reluctant readers, even as, as old as high school. All of those things I, I can totally relate to when a child comes in and says, no, that book's too thick. I I think back all the time to the secret guard. I go, I remember that. I remember that feeling. And I always say, can you imagine how you're going to feel when you finish it? It's going to be the most amazing feeling. The children's department isn't just a point of entry for kids. Sometimes it brings their parents back to the library after a long hiatus. Here's Jim Borzileri from the reference department. That was my gateway in after my you know, my misspent youth phase. And it was this wonderful place. The people there were really committed. They got to know Evan. They knew his, they knew what he liked. As he started working his way through the dinosaur books, they were like, oh, we got a new dinosaur book for you, Evan. (gasps) Nothing would make a little, you know, eight-year-old's heart go pitter-pat than have the latest, hottest book with the scariest dinosaurs. So, you know, that was just a wonderful experience. It was just part of our life. The Wheezy was just there. I think was part of it. It was just this warm, wonderful, friendly place that was helping you raise your kid. What's not to like about that? Jesse Dearborn has worked in Wheezy for seven years. She says parents sometimes need reassurance that this is a kid-friendly zone. Uh, we're not really a shushing <laughs> library and children's uh there's like a certain amount of noise that i think is acceptable and like parents who haven't been there like they try to keep their kids quiet and it's like oh no you're okay so when i was a kid it was like a very almost a severe space i guess like to walk in it's so quiet but the wheezy library is not that quiet place katie dehart started working in the children's department four years ago She grew up in Pennsylvania and remembers her childhood library as being not very friendly. But she says Wheezy is completely different. It is not a shush library. Um, Sometimes I wish it was a little more shush because it can get really loud with the children. But yes, it definitely is a much friendlier atmosphere and 
people, their first time they come in, they can be a little uncomfortable, but then the next time the children come in, they're like, they're fine. They know just what to do and just how to ask and, and it works really well. Not every kid is an enthusiastic library patron in the making, but that doesn't discourage Leslie. She sees a potential bookworm in every child that comes in the door. It's just a matter of finding the right book for them to squirm into. One thing we try is, is to be as friendly and helpful and as we can. You want them to feel comfortable here. You want them to feel safe. You want them to not feel embarrassed or self-conscious about saying, I don't like to read. Who here doesn't like to read? Because I need, you're my favorite person. My job now will be to find something that changes your opinion about that. You know, when I'm doing story times, sometimes preschool story times, I can look out in the crowd and I can see that little boy over in the corner is just not at all into anything I'm doing. But if I have a nonfiction book and I always bring one with me, let's say the theme is trees. So I'll read a couple of stories that involve trees. And then at the end, I'll pull out the DK guide to trees, which is a nonfiction sort of encyclopedia. And then all of a sudden that little boy in the corner perks up. I know, uh uh-uh, we've got a nonfiction person here. And I've got two twins, total nonfiction. They're just over there snoozing away during picture books. But if I, when I start pulling out nonfiction, they're totally engaged and alert. And Jesse says there is so much to choose from in children's literature now. Just the breadth of a story that, of the different kinds of stories that can be told for children. Some of them are really moving and some of them are just beautiful. If there's one thing I could take away from working there, it's learning about all these authors and illustrators. The types of stories that are being told are changing and they're more inclusive. I think like publishers are definitely trying to find some unknown voices and different nationalities. I think the audience is changing too. And I see this in graphic novels too. They're telling all different kinds of stories and they know like people will read them now. Maybe they didn't know that then. (laughs) I think it's interesting to see that change. Once they stumble upon the right series, graphic novel or picture book, many kids are off and running, or should I say, off and reading. One thing I love is when we get a patron, a small child who obviously the parent has taught them how to order books through clams. And it's always really obvious when that happens because we'll get 75 books for like one kid. (laughs) You know, there's a little bit of training that has to go on about what they can and can, you know, how many books to order when they're on. But it's funny, I'll get through training one child and now all of a sudden I realize we've got another one on our hands. And I saw her the other day at the Lighthouse School and I, and I was talking to the children and I said, well, you know, you can get a parent to help you order books online or your classmate here could help you. <laughs> You know, it was one of those things. She had 50 books checked out and I and there were like 25 books that came in in the bags. That That's kind of fun when that happens. You know, you love to have a child that's overusing the library. <laughs> you know, there's so many kids that just come in and find a corner and read. I was closing up the other day and and it was like, like 15 minutes later it was on a Monday and I close up we close at one and I have to stay till two and like quarter past one this girl like kind of walks up to my desk and I said where did you come from she said I was over there reading <laughs> it's like, oh we're closed <laughs> some kids really do benefit so well for the just to have a nook to go to and read once you get a child reading The next step is to keep them reading throughout the year, especially in the summer when school is out. Maintaining the habit of reading is crucial for kids to avoid what Leslie calls the summer slide. This is the weeks away from school where kids are most likely to fall behind on their reading skills. Your loss is cumulative. You just need to keep them up. Just keep up because the losses that they experience this year will add on to the 
losses they experience next year. And it just keeps building so that by the time you're in high school, you can be three to five years behind a classmate who's a regular reader. And it's just so easily preventable. To help with this, Leslie and her team offer a summer reading program. One of the things that I value most about my trips into the school with summer reading is that I'm standing in front of the entire fifth grade and every single member of the fifth grade gets a backpack and summer reading materials. And in that way, there's true equity of access to a program that I'm producing. Everybody gets summer reading regardless of who they are or what they do. If you are a parent, Leslie encourages you not to get too hung up on what your kids are reading, as long as they're reading. There is no junk for kids, by the way. I hear that all the time. There's no such thing as junk for children. Jesse agrees. Oh, I would say, like, give graphic novels a chance because a lot of parents come in and they want, like, the kids want the graphic novels, but in their, like, they, they probably didn't grow up with them and in their mind, they're like, that's not a real book, but they are real books. And as long as you're reading them, it opens, it definitely opens up a, a world as corny as that might be to say, it opens up a new world and it could be a stepping stone to like thicker books. The graphic novels that are being published today are totally different. It's not superheroes. It's like different kinds of stories and like perspectives of children in the world. And it's a valid reading selection, you know? But what about the kids that just don't take to books like other kids do? They've tried all kinds of books. They just aren't into it. What then? Not every child is a big reader. It's hard for parents, I think, to accept that. My daughter wasn't a big reader. She read. She was in the English class in some advanced when she was in high school. Not every child is a reader. So you have to figure out how to get them comfortable enough with books that they can keep up their reading skills, keep up with their schoolwork, and not suffer through it. Even more than making every kid a reader, Leslie wants to make every kid a library patron. I, I want to make lifelong library users out of every kid that walks in the door just because it's free. And even if you're not a reader, we have movies, we have books, you know, we have CDs, we have music, we have graphic novels, we have video games. If you need tax forms when you're older, if you need help making, if you need to make a copy, if you need to send a fax, there are all these services. You want people to get used to knowing they can come to the library for that. And I think that that starts when they're a child. Did you hear that? Even if you're not a reader, we want you to come in. Jim remembers many of his son's friends who weren't readers and suspects that's why they weren't library users either. Because my kid, besides being a library rat, turned out, you know, his one big sport was hockey. You know, because of that, he grew up as a rink rat, you know, and that was a whole other crowd. And I know for a lot of those people, and, and it sort of makes sense, there's a lot of people on this island who have diagnosed reading and other disabilities because you can make a fortune on the trades out here and that's not critical. And I knew that a lot of the kids that were every bit as smart as Evan, you know, were IEP. There are people that just have trouble learning. You yeah. know, and it's not just dyslexia. In some cases, there is just, they will get there eventually, but they're going to need a lot more time than anyone else. This is something Lincoln Thurber, head of reference, can appreciate personally. When I was a child, I lived in Brockton, Massachusetts, which is a very big municipal library system. And our local library was um, just a few miles from our house. And so I remember going there for sure and getting my first library card. You had to be able to write out your name and sign your card before you could get a library card. So my parents and I practiced that before I went to get my library card. And when I went, I have dyslexia. So I thought I was writing Lincoln but uh, I was actually just writing N-O-I-N. So for many years, uh, my sister would tease me that my name was Noin. I think even the concept of what dyslexia is and what the people that have it are like has changed over the years and, and, and for the better. I wasn't re really reading early books until like the third grade, but by fifth grade, I was reading novels. My friends and, and classmates in fifth grade if you were to ask them, like, you know, what, what's Lincoln doing? Lincoln was like reading a novel. 
I was reading like Frank Herbert's Dune, which is like a 900 page book in like fifth grade. I was a a voracious reader once I could read. With readers and non-readers in mind, the Wheezy staff has created all kinds of programs that attract a wider range of kids, especially kids who thought libraries weren't for them. You know, I think Minecraft is a really good example of a program that we put on that attracted, well, yeah, there were there were kids in the room that were readers and regular library users, but there were so many children that came through that program that I had never seen before, who'd never come into the library before. And I think our programming, that's one way to pull them in. But all of those programs, even Story Craft, where you might read a short story, but then they're busy doing a craft, all of those things, I've found children in those programs who aren't the big readers, but are drawn here for other reasons. Um, Liz's music classes, her puppet shows, all of that, all of those things, they all promote literacy skills underneath it all, but on the surface, it's just fun. Jessie is amazed by how much more libraries have to offer now compared to when she was young. When I was a kid, it was like the little paper card, handwritten name and number. And like now I wouldn't even have dreamt of all the access you get with online resources. Like we've got Libby at the Athenaeum, we've got Hoopla. I never thought like I could download a TV show or learn a new language. It's just incredible, like, just like how technology has developed since I was a kid. Here's Lincoln again. Uh, when a parent maybe brings their child in and they're, you know, the the concept for the for the parent is like, oh, let's get them something to read or something like that. But they, they'll pa- pass by a bulletin board where they see that, you know, there'll be an event for, you know, working with Legos. And the kids go, I can build with Legos at the library? And it's like, yeah. You can build those Legos at the library. Whether it's a book or a movie or a program that brings kids and their parents in the door, the staff tries to make sure they have a great experience and that they make a connection with the library. This is Ellen Young from the Children's Department. Oh, I did have a kid that um, I did uh, teach him to read a little bit of Go Dog Go. He was more willing to sit with me and read it than he was with a parent and The mom was ecstatic. She came back later, like a week later to return the books and was like, oh my God, my kid, you just taught him to read. He's, he's reading now he's reading. And last summer he came and he learned how to ride a bicycle. And this summer he's come and he's learned how to read. And I thought, yeah, young family's doing pretty good. We got him on a bike. We got him reading. He's pretty, (laughs) we're on our way. When COVID hit in the spring of 2020, the children's department wanted to come up with something anything, an activity or a service that would keep kids and their parents connected with the library. And boy, did they hit it out of the park. I have three words for you. Grab and go. I'll let Katie explain. They're craft projects in a paper lunch bag. We would find these crafts online and make them our own and write directions and, you know, get all the ingredients for the different crafts and put them in a bag. And Jesse did an art craft and a paper craft. And I did the story and craft where I had to find a story to, to kind of go with the craft I was doing. And Ellen did a teen craft and Leslie did the STEM craft. And so like every week, every day of the week, there was another bag and they would just, they, we would make 20 to probably 40 or 50 of them and they would be gone in half an hour. They go out at 9.30 and they're gone. Jesse jumped in with both feet and came up with all kinds of kids projects. They weren't just fun, they were appropriate for all ages. I've done a magic wand kit a few times. I think that one was really popular and I, I was able to like, tie it in with Harry Potter a little bit. Uh, I had fun with the packaging. I wrapped it up with like little bits of twine and a, a stamp that I found at Create with like a moon and stars. And it was just a little more fun to pick up. Recently, I did an owl project. It was like a 3D paper owl with like collage wings. And, it, and I gave the kids little like envelopes with Hogwarts wax seals. That was really fun. Glue Batik Backpack. It's awesome. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I got these backpacks, uh, canvas backpacks, drawstring backpacks. You, you take gel glue, Elmer's gel glue, and you draw a design on the bag with the glue and let it dry. And then you paint over it with fabric paint. And after that dries, you like soak it in hot water and the glue comes off. And it's this beautiful batik bag and it's they're beautiful and of course I had to make one you know for a demonstration and I had my daughter make one for a demonstration and my granddaughter so that we had kind of various levels of is this something that's easy that can be done and it, and they both said oh this is the best one you've done because they pretty much have been my guinea pigs throughout this. It was a lot of work, but it was like, it was a good thing to have. It was a good anchor for the staff, I think, while everything's so unknown. I did enjoy it. it was, it's a lot of work, but I found a lot of fun projects to do. It was just, it was a good creative outlet for me personally. There were lots of fun ones. They really were fun. There were very few that was like, meh, but <laughs> that was a lot of work. Grandparents, parents, caretakers, and teachers were so grateful for the free craft projects and looked forward to stopping by the Wheezy Porch week after week to grab their grab-and-go bags. There was one that I did hear from, I think it was a grandmother. She emailed a picture of what her grandson was making, and it was a ship in a bottle craft. Like It was a cardboard cut out of a bottle, and you make a little clay ship. And he had like a whole story plan behind it. Like the ship was haunted and it was like a specific ship that went down in history, I think. And I was so happy to see that he was so into it. We had a Girl Scout troop leader picking them up. She would go around and deliver them to each of her troop. And then they would get on Zoom and craft together, which I thought was really like, if I can help out a Girl Scout troop, I'm thrilled. The building's open again for people to check out materials, but not everything is quite the same as it was before COVID. Nevertheless, there are still special moments happening. One mom came in with two little kids and an infant strapped on, and they picked out a bunch of books. And then she, you know, we've, we've taken all the chairs out, the big dog chair, whatever that thing was, is gone. There's no tables, you know, you get half an hour to browse and that's it. They picked their books pretty quickly, and then they sat on the floor in the little corral, and she read to them, and it was like, oh, that's what, you know, that's what you live for. And someone was like, oh, maybe we should ask them to leave, you know, so someone else can come in. And I thought, you know, there's something so special about coming in the library and having your mom read a book to you or having an adult. And the two kids were just cuddled around mom and listening to her every word, and it's like... It's not like reading a book at home. You're sitting in the library. You just pull out a book and mom reads it to you. So that, that was fun to see that. A unique part of working in the children's department, as opposed to any other part of the library, is watching the young patrons grow up. Leslie, Ellen, Katie, and Jesse all have the privilege of watching kids go from picture books to chapter books and eventually ascending the stairs to the young adult section in the Great Hall. It's such a gift to be able to work with kids. I know that some people go, oh, children, and they, you know, they're worried about working with them. Like, they're just the most honest, wonderful little humans to interact with. You know, you get them at a point in life where at least the preschoolers and the younger children, where they really don't know much yet. And so there's a certain innocence there that you're working with. Everything out of their mouth is honest and straightforward and, you know, sometimes funny, maybe inappropriate here and there, but, you know, they're children. I like being in the children's room when it's got a good amount of little kids in it. When they come for programs and it fills up and fills up and fills up and it gets really loud and then we send them downstairs and they file downstairs and it gets quiet again. And that ebb and flow of the kids coming and going, it's really cool to just be there with the families and, and watching them grow up. This is special for Katie because now she is seeing the kids of the kids she knows. 
I worked at the middle school and high school for 15 years as the assistant to the school nurse. And now at the library, I have kids that I had in school coming into the library with their kids. And it's really cool. It's really neat to, to have that connection. Being on Nantucket for so long, there's so many like generations of connections. When a child is ready to move beyond the Wheezy Library, they can climb the winding staircase up to the teen section, where Ellen, who is also the young adult library associate, is waiting to guide them along the way. It's pretty amazing. I see kids that started with me when they were five, when they finally could come to the library Lego program, and they're all excited. And, and now they're like going up to the teen section. And I'll, I'll say, you're too old to read these books downstairs. You're, these books are kid books. You need to be upstairs. And they don't always know about upstairs. They don't always know there's a teen section. So that's pretty exciting to turn somebody on to that, to bring them upstairs and say, look, this whole area is all books for teens. They're not little kids books anymore. It's not just the topics of the books and materials that change when young patrons head up to the teen section. Their reasons for being at the library sometimes change. What is it to kids today? It's maybe a little time out space. Um, I like that in, in the summer in the busy, busy town, it's still a nice quiet spot. And you could tell these are kind of the quieter kids that will come up there and just read for a little while or just hang out to get away from all the hustle and bustle. It's sort of a little oasis. Sometimes they're doing homework. Sometimes they're reading. Sometimes they're just resting. There's so many kids out there that, that could easily get lost. You know, you're not in sports, you're not in, in the play. What, what do you do? Where do you go? Where do you hang out? So I think it's been nice to, to watch some kids blossom like that. And our entire library staff is always ready to meet our young patrons where they're at. This is Liz Kelly, head of adult circulation. They don't have to just stay in that collection. They can go into the other parts of the library and check out anything that they're looking for. Laura Pless Friedman works in adult circulation and has two teenagers. She has watched their reading choices change and evolve. The girls have kind of come in and out of reading. You know, of course, when they were little, I'd bring home 30 picture books and I was a hero. And then, you know, and then the series and I was still a hero. And then, then they decided they were going to pick their own. And I was like, wait, what? Don't you need me to pick up your book? No, I do not. So, so that's been interesting during the teenage years. She says every kid goes at their own pace and there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be reading at your grade level. If you still, if you still enjoy, you know, books down in the kids library and you're 13, fine, you know, stay, stay down there. Maybe you're not ready to go up to YA and have those more mature topics. You're just reading for enjoyment. Since Leslie first brought her daughter to the library more than 20 years ago, there is so much more for children and young adults to take advantage of. There's definitely more programming going on and a wider variety of programming for children. When she was young and we'd come to Wheezy, there were the story times, the music classes, and the movement classes. But beyond that, there really wasn't much. And now I've got every member of the Wheezy staff is involved in running at least one program. Leslie, Jesse, Ellen, and Katie continue to do everything they can to welcome young patrons into the Wheezy Library for Children. They want it to be a place where every kid finds something that piques their curiosity. I'm there. Come visit me. Tell me what you did today. You don't have to come check out a book. I just want to visit with you. You know, I want to make them feel like it's okay just to come in and say hi. It's okay to just come to the library and climb the trees. We just want you to use the library because it belongs to you. It's here, and wherever you go, wherever you move, there's going to be another one. We just want you to use it. Behind the Shelves is a production of the Nantucket Athenaeum. It was written, edited, and narrated by me, Janet Forrest. Special thanks to my colleagues featured in this episode. Laura Pless Friedman, Jim Borzilleri, Elizabeth Kelly, Leslie Malcolm, Jesse Dearborn, Katie DeHart, Lincoln Thurber, and Ellen Young. The Nantucket Athenaeum is located at 1 India Street in Nantucket, Massachusetts, 
We'd love for you to come by and say hello. You can visit our website at nantucketathenaeum.org. Join me again next week when we take another look behind the shelves.